One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. May God add blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. He chose me. I wasn't sure he even remembered my name. We'd spoken a few times, but I had mostly been in the crowds during his teachings. He had no reason to remember me, yet he specifically called me out of the crowd that day. Judas, he said. I was sure he meant one of the dozens of other people named Judas, but no. His eyes met mine again as he said, Judas Iscariot. Shocked, I immediately began moving toward the group of other disciples. And as I walked forward, I felt like they were watching me, staring me down as they would anyone like me. The other disciples, they, they weren't exactly the most welcoming of people, but I can't really blame them. I didn't fit in with this group, no matter what Jesus said. They, they were mostly fishermen with a few tax collectors thrown in. They were all from around here. But nevertheless, Jesus smiled. As I walked over to the group, he, he welcomed me and gave me a friendly pat on the shoulder. And if the other disciples had any objections, they certainly kept them to themselves. Me, I, I had reservations of my own. But none of that mattered at that moment. Jesus had no reservations about choosing me on that day. Of course, that was three years ago. I wonder how he would feel today. Judas is the most hated, loathed, and despised of the 12 disciples. Just in my brief research over the last few years, I've come to realize that people really really hate Judas. <laughs> like they really, really hate Judas. Commentaries, scholars, researchers, they all have this bent toward Judas that says he is the traitor and therefore he is reviled. He crucified our Lord. It's because of him that Jesus was crucified. But there's more to Judas than that one decision. He was a person like you and like me. He had a past, he had a family, he had a hometown just like you and I do. In those parts of Judas, the family, the hometown, his past, those things help us understand why Judas made the decisions that he did. Now you know as well as I do that we can rationalize the decisions that we make. We are especially good at rationalizing bad decisions. Some of us major unofficially in rationalizing bad decisions. We have made quite a life out of it, and, and maybe we will in the future as well. We get that. We make choices all the time that are not the best for us, and we know it, um, but in the moment, they seem like great ideas. I do it too, and I'm a preacher. We're all in this together. Judas was the same as us. So over the next few weeks, we will be following Jesus to the cross, and we'll be following Jesus to the cross from the perspective of Judas, the most hated disciple. And we'll ask a few questions along the way. The questions I want you to ask are questions like this. What does Judas' story tell us about our own stories? And you're like, hopefully nothing. Well, how about this one? Were there warning signs that Judas missed? 
did he ever really love Jesus in the first place? What would cause us to do the unthinkable? That's a question. Could we ever do what Judas did? What would cause you and me to do the unthinkable thing of betraying the Savior? And then finally, is there any hope for the Judas that is among us? Because here's what I've learned in my life. In every one of us, we have this desire that we want to be like Simon Peter, right? Whenever you hear sermons about the disciples, especially when you hear this long list of the 12 Jesus called them all, we all start with Simon Peter, right? He's the one that walked on the way. He's the one that first said, oh, Jesus, you are the son of God. He's the one that made an absolute declaration of faith. He's the one that Jesus said, and on this rock, I will build my church. And then sometimes we say, oh, well, I'm just like Simon Peter because he denied Jesus three times, and gosh darn it, so do I. Boy, do I. I deny Jesus all the time. But you know what? Jesus loves me. And we love the happily ever after that takes place on resurrection morning with Simon Peter, don't we? But what I've learned in my life is that, yeah, there may be a little bit of Simon Peter, the rock on which the church is built in my heart. But whether I want to recognize it or not, there's also a little bit of Judas in me. And I bet that there's a little bit of Judas in you as well. So this series is for the Judas in all of us. So here's the question, who is Judas? The scriptures are uh, admittedly a little ambiguous as far as who Judas is. We only have a handful of passages that even reference him, and they're not great. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, right? Uh, we can't say his name without saying, he betrayed Jesus right? Anytime it says, and then Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, da, 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 right? It finishes the story. That's the way it is in the scriptures. You have to do a little digging to figure out who Judas is. However, we do have two big indicators in the scripture today. And you're like, are you kidding me? That was like a genealogy list. That's the most boring thing in the world, right? It's just a list. That's the sort of thing that we kind of glaze over. Yeah, name, 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 name. Ooh, Judas Iscariot. Ooh, okay. And then we get to the good stuff. But I am actually going to propose that there's some good stuff in this. Who is Jesus? Uh, Judas? Who is Jesus? That's a great question, too. Uh, who is Judas? Well, the first indicator that we have is in his name, and you may have heard this before. Judas Iscariot. Notice, Judas is the only disciple in that list who seems to have a last name, but know that that is not his last name. Ugh. Shocker, right? That last name, Iscariot, is more of a signifier. I mean, it, it, it is actually a phrase, ish kiriot, or ish kirioth. And you're like, oh, that clears it up. <laughs> well, translated, it means man of kirioth. K-E-R-I-O-T-H, for those of you that are taking notes. So Judas, comma, man of kirioth. And you're like, well, what is, is kirioth? Like, is that like a disease? No, that is a location. Judas is a man from a town called Kiriot or Kiriath, okay? You're like, where is that? Well, fortunately, we have a map. Behold, this is the Galilee uh, Sea at the top, and then we have Jerusalem. We know Jer Jerusalem. That's the place where the temple is. That is where uh, the kings of Judah particularly um, reigned during their, their kingship. This is where Jesus, um, you know, is eventually crucified. Uh, th this is the center religiously for the Jewish people during this time. Kiriat is a, a little lower than that. In fact, it's south of Jerusalem, and just north, 10 miles north of Kiriat, is a place called Hebron, which is another really important place that we're not going to really get into tonight. We'll talk a little bit about it next week. But this is to say that Judas is from the, the lower part of Israel, south of Jerusalem. Okay, neat, big deal. Well, this is why it's a big deal. This is a critical part of our understanding of who Judas Iscariot is because it reveals to us that Judas is the only disciple that's not from the region of Galilee. 
He is a southerner from south of Jerusalem. And all of the others are from the region of Galilee. They were fishermen, uh, some were tax collectors, there were a number that uh, were from the outskirts of Galilee, but by and large, they are all from that upper region, region, and he is from Cariot, which is important for us to know, and you're like, well, how do we really know that? We, we see the moments that Jesus picks up several of these other disciples, but one interesting thing about this is that Judas is always given that moniker, Iscariot. Essentially, his name is Judas, and he's not from around here. That's his entire thing. Simon Peter, um, Simon, we're going to call you Peter. Uh, We have uh, Judas, son of Alphaeus, right? But then we have Judas, who's, who's a foreigner. He's not from around here, okay? Now, this is important. Why is it important? Because Judas is already an outsider, He's from a town that is south of Jerusalem, and in some ways that's a totally different context than the land around Galilee. So why is he up in Galilee uh, visiting Jesus? Well, it's unknown whether or not Judas' family, particularly his father, his father's name is Simon, and we find this out in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 71. That's a long chapter, by the way. Um, We find out that that he has a father, but we're not sure whether his father took the family and moved up north um, and lived in Galilee, or if Judas was merely visiting Galilee, uh, maybe even to see Jesus, because he'd heard about Jesus. But it's safe to assume that Judas, by virtue of the name that he's given in the scriptures, was in a place and among a people that's foreign to him. So why do we care about that? This is why we care about that. The experience of being away from loved ones, friends, and all things familiar takes a toll on a person. You get this, right? College student, left your home. Now, some of you have settled into your new life. You're sophomores, you're juniors, you're seniors, and you're like, I, you know what? I am so home here. But that freshman year, it was like a different world. Where are my friends? Where are my family? They're a phone call away, and I'm going to go visit them every single weekend, right, until I find my people. And we go everywhere trying to find our people. We try to make friends. We try to do whatever we can to, to not feel alone. But the truth is that we experience this sort of thing all the time. Anytime someone has to move to a new city, and, and truly, ask any of our seniors that are about to graduate and move away how excited they are about that. Some things they're very excited about. But you know what they're not excited about? Starting over with no friends or people around. Seniors, get stressed. And you're like so excited about this next chapter, but I am going to tell you it is going to knock you on your butt. From 22 to 30. (laughs) In fact, I struggled so badly with this that I bought a book right? You, you all, some of you complain that whenever you come to me for, for spiritual guidance or pastoral care, I always send you with a book. Well, I prescribed myself a book. How did I find a book? I went to Google, okay? I was like, Google, I'm having a hard time in my 20s. Found a book called Navigating Your Turbulent 20s, which is the stupidest title in the world. But you know what? Very helpful. <laughs> because I was like, someone gets me. I'm not alone. Because when you leave college, oh boy, you're going to feel alone. Judas. (laughs) Anytime someone moves to a new city or a new school or a new job or whatever it is, the change brings with it a significant season of isolation. You get this to some degree. There's scarcity of friends and you are losing all of your significant relationships. And even more than that, there's an anxiety of if I start to hang out with these new friends... What about my old friends? And then it gets even worse. If you've got a Molly in your life, not the drug, but a friend named Molly who's married to your best friend Ben who calls you up and said, Wade, I see that on Facebook you have new friends. You haven't replaced me, have you? And I'm like, you live like an hour away. I'm so alone. (laughs) There's all kinds of emotions that go into this. And you're like, I've I've, got to move 
forward with my life. Well, how am I going to do this? There's all kinds of anxieties. Nothing feels familiar. Nothing feels like home. And even for some of you, you go off to college, and do you remember the first Thanksgiving or the first holiday break that you went home? Suddenly, you're like, oh, I'm finally coming home, and you realize that your bedroom was turned into a dog room. You realize that things are not the same. Where did all of my friends go? Well, they've moved on with their lives as well. Or, worse yet, the people that you think are so familiar look to you and they say, you've changed. What have you allowed that highfalutin education to do to you, right? So some of, some of you have these conversations. And so the question is, where is home and what do you do? It's a crisis we all face as we grow up. It's for this reason that many of us uh, try to complete our first year away at college and then we bail and move a little closer to home. And there's no shame in that because it's hard being lonely, being isolated, being in unfamiliar territory. I know it because I, I did it. I moved to Tuscaloosa after I'd had a nice stint in Atlanta for three years, which was hard, but I was surrounded by some friends from college. I uh, moved uh, back to my hometown, served in a local church there for four years. When I was ordained, uh, I, I was, um, I, I was uh, ordained by the, the bishop, by the North Alabama Conference, and then they sent me to Tuscaloosa to start a new church, and for 10 months, it was utter hell. <laughs> I, I, I'm not being sarcastic. It was horrific. Why? Because the thing about starting a church is that you're sent somewhere without any people, with very little money, and you're told, go and build a church. And I'm like, how do you build a church? I'm 27 years old. And um, they, they say, just go and do it. The Lord will be with you. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so for the first uh, several months, I uh, would, would wake up early. That's when I started to be an early riser. I woke up at about 5 a.m. because that is uh, almost what John Wesley did. He woke up a couple hours before that, but I, I decided five was an appropriate time for me. And so I got up, and I would pray, and I would seek the Lord, and then I would go into town, and I, I would do my best to build relationships with a city that I had no business being in, except the Lord sent me there through the Methodists. Y'all, it was tough. I remember the first week, every night, I would uh, hop in bed, and I would pull the covers up close, and I would say the same prayer. I'm like, oh God, what have you done? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Wasn't a great prayer, but it was a true prayer, and that's important. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How many of you know what true prayer is, right? I love the prayers where we're like, oh God, you are my sword, my shield, you are my rock, I love you. Amen. Good night. I love those. But a true prayer is, God, where are you? Amen. <laughs> My favorite prayers are the truest prayers. And I think those are God's favorite prayers too. I do. I think God loves it when we remind ourselves of who God is. But I think that God really loves it when we are struggling with God. And saying, God, I'm looking for you. I'm not giving up on you. I'm still at least praying, right? Amen. For nearly a year, even as I was working to plant the, the, the church, I grieved the loss of my family and friends. It had a paralyzing effect on me for 10 months until I truly began to feel at home. And let me tell you, when you feel isolated, what are the things that you, you allow yourself to do? Well, first of all, if you don't make friends for a while, you begin to have self-doubt, right? Am, am I doing the right thing in my life? Should it be this hard? Did I somehow hear God wrong? Sometimes uh, we get so desperate for connection that we are willing to do anything and go anywhere with whomever might take us, right? So suddenly decisions that we wouldn't ordinarily make, we will more readily make because, you know, I, I want to fit in with this group or I at least just want to hang out with somebody. So it just doesn't, I, I'll just do it, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go with them, or I wouldn't normally be this person, person's friend, and, and gosh, doesn't that translate to, to dating relationships as well? We get lonely, we get isolated, and then all of a sudden it says, well, you, you, you know what, like, he, he swiped right on me first. <laughs> At least there's something. Something's better than nothing. 
Now, I say this to you because you know the danger and the trap that isolation brings, and that's exactly what I believe that Judas was feeling. He was a citizen of Cariot, forced to transfer to Galilee for some reason, unrevealed by Scripture. All we know is that his name is Judas, not from around here. That's his nickname. Stranger, not from around here. Man, when I came to Tuscaloosa, do you know how long it took me for, to, uh, for, for me to gain the trust of people in Tuscaloosa because I was an outsider from literally an hour away? And they were like, oh, you're just not from Tuscaloosa. You don't remember. Da, 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 da. I'm like, but I'm an Alabama fan. Yeah, so is everybody. Roll Tide. Um, <clears throat> it took me forever, and I did everything I could. I'm just now kind of feeling like this is home for me. So maybe Judas felt that toll of isolation and homesickness in his life. And maybe, just maybe, that's the reason why Jesus chose him to be a part of this group. Judas, yeah, you, not from around here. Yeah, that Judas, not you, Judas, not you, Judas. Yes, you, Judas, son of Alphaeus, you get to be in. But you, Judas, from not around here, you, come on. Maybe that's why Jesus chose him. We believe that Jesus is not just the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. Therefore, when we read God's words in Scripture, we can also attribute them to Jesus. That the heart that is revealed about God in Scripture is also the heart of Jesus. Therefore, in the Garden of Eden, when God says over the first dude, Adam, it is not good for the man to be alone. Maybe Jesus is instill, uh, like also sharing that heart. It is not good for Judas to be alone. So Judas, come join our group. I don't know any of them. Oh, they'll love you, right? Yeah, you're going to love him. Judas, come on. It is God's weapon against the isolation that we all feel at one point or another. Judas is, is one of these people that is on the outskirts. He's on the outside. And Jesus says to him, you come forward. This is what the church is. This is what Wesley tries to do. Do you realize that this is what we try to do here every single Wednesday night? Every single Wednesday night, after we have this time where I teach and talk and ramble for a while, you go into small groups. Spark groups is what we call them. And some spark groups uh, lead into ember groups, which is a, a secondary level of discipleship, which ultimately lead into phoenix groups. Now listen, Many times, I don't particularly care what you discuss in these spark groups, but what I care is that we fight isolation because I know what isolation can do to a person. So perhaps the very first lesson of Judah's story teaches us this, don't do life alone. However, th there is a second lesson in this passage, and you're like, it's a passage of names. We're spending a lot of time on a passage of names. There's another one. And it comes from that city, Cariot. Cariot is mentioned a few times in Scripture, but each time proves to be useful for our purposes. The first time comes from Joshua chapter 15, verse 20 through 25. If you've got your Bibles, you can flip there real quick, but we're not going to linger here too much. So it may, may be okay just to kind of read it on the screen. Joshua and the armies of Israel have conquered a lot of land, and they've taken land, and this is meant to be the promised land. So as they are divvying up, all of the land that they have acquired in the book of Joshua, here's what it says. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Judah according to its clans. The southernmost towns of the tribe of Judah in the Negev toward the boundary of Edom were Kabzil, Eder, Jagur, Kina, Dimona, Arada, Kadesh, Hazor, Ithnon, on and on and on until you get to a place at the very end called Kiriat Hezron or Hebron or uh, Hazor. This is an interesting piece because it is specifically called out as a boundary of the land promised. You're like, big deal. Well, what's the promised land? The promised land is the land that God has promised to the Israelites. You will live in this land. It will be a land, the Bible says, flowing with milk and honey. You don't understand milk and honey. It sounds disgusting together. But the land flowing with milk and honey is a luxurious land, a land that you are going to live very, very nicely in. You're going to love it. It's going to be amazing. Judas' hometown is intentionally referred to as part of the promised land. 
However, there is another town by the very same name, not the one that Judas is from. It's in a place called Moab, in an outskirt of the Israel, uh, Israeli promised land. It's in a place called Moab, uh, and, uh, filled with Moabites, enemies of God's people. And this is what the Bible says about it in Jeremiah 48. Moab is disgraced, for she is shattered. Wail and cry out, announced by the Arnon that Moab is destroyed. Judgment has come to the plateau, to all of these places, and then ultimately in verse 24, to Kiriot and Basra, to all the towns of Moab, far and near. Jeremiah 48, 41 tells us why. Kiriot will be captured, and the strongholds taken, and in that day, the hearts of Moab's warriors will be like the heart of a woman in labor. So why are we talking about this one? Because this is a tale of two cities, <laughs> right? A tale of two Kiriots. One is, promise, is, is dreamed to be the promised land for the people, and the other is a city ruined and ravaged by idolatrous and sinful ways. One is a land that's promised to the people of God, and a land that's ultimately lost because they began looking like the other Kiriot. They gave themselves over to idols. They betrayed and rebelled against the Lord, and God sold them into the, the hands of their enemies. And Assyria, and then later Babylon, overthrew them. Specifically with that, this Kiriot, Babylon overthrew it. And when I hear that story, I think to myself, this is a wasted opportunity. And when I think of a wasted opportunity, I look at Judas, and I think, Judas was a wasted opportunity. Judas came from a town that was dreamed to be so much, and yet it fell. And I wonder, what kind of dreams did God have, did Jesus have, specifically for Judas? What were those dreams, and how did he squander those things? Judas came from a city and a people whose central message throughout its existence was a wasted opportunity. How can we get back to where we once were? How can we get back to what God wanted us to be? And yet we know, because of the end of the story, that Judas lived into that wasted opportunity again. So hear me out. This is what the Bible refers to as, uh, or theologians refer to from the Bible, as generational sin. Generational sin is the idea that the sins of the father, and I'm using that collectively, so it could be mothers as well, the sins of the parents lead to consequences and furthered sin for every subsequent, subsequent generation. Now, you may not understand uh, that whole curse mentality. Uh, the father is cursed, and for the, the son, the grandson, the great-grandson, on and on and on. But I understand it pretty well. I said at the beginning of this that in all of us, there's a little bit of Simon Peter that we love, and then there's a little bit of Judas. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the Judas that lives in me. Because you need to know that there's some Judas that lives in me, just as I believe there's some Judas that lives in you. Whenever I think of generational sin, I think of difficult family situations, situations of addiction and alcoholism and abuse. You know those situations. And I know those situations because I come from one. I come from a family that endured substance abuse, starting with alcohol and moving to drugs. It was my dad. And, and though things are much better now, my childhood was filled with this. Is dad good today or is dad using today? When I come home from school, is, has dad been drinking or is dad okay? And it was always this sense of being on edge. Having done a great deal of study on children of addicts and their psychology, I've come to recognize a common drive among them. And so somebody suggested a book to me. Uh, it was a book called Adult Children of Alcoholics. Uh, there is a list of uh, traits, commonalities that are present in adult children of alcoholics. So I want to share those with you because I want you to see what a Judas manifestation of a wasted opportunity looks like. This was the list. Adult children of alcoholics do the following. First, they guess at what normal behavior is. What do normal families do, right? 
Number two, they have difficulty following a project through from beginning to end. They lie when it would be just as easy to tell the truth. They judge themselves without mercy. They have difficulty having fun. They take themselves very seriously. They have difficulty with intimate relationships. They overreact to changes over which they have no control. They constantly seek approval and affirmation. They feel that they're different from other people. They're super responsible or they're super irresponsible, not both. They are extremely loyal, even in the face of evidence that the loyalty is undeserved. And finally, they are impulsive. So I read this book, and every chapter that told uh, these 13 chapters, I checked it off, and I said, that's me. That's me. One after another. I went to a therapist, and I decided to process this with somebody, a therapist that sees therapists, so you, their BS meter is really high, so that really helps, because, um, you know, if you are kind of a counselor in some ways, you can kind of, you know, sidestep the counseling. Not so with this particular one, which is exactly what I needed. And so she asked me, uh, so how are you? And I was like, eh, <laughs> I've read this book. And we went through it, and she said, well, which ones apply to you? And I said, all of them. And so we talked about every one of them for multiple sessions because there's a lot to unpack. And you're like, wait, how are you every one, uh, every one of them? Some of you have said to me, <laughs> jokingly, oh, Wade, you are, uh, you're just not very responsible. Or, oh, man, like you have such a, like you're, you're, some of you have even said to me, Wade, you uh, just like, sometimes I forget that you're like a grown adult. Let me tell you something. That's a testament to what God has done in me over the last 20 years, because when I was 15 years old, I was 40 years old. And today, the fact that I'm living on this college campus pretty much, working with college students, is in some ways a way that God has redeemed a part of my life that was a wasted opportunity. It's a way that God has continued to work in these 13 ways and continues to heal me. And I'm not done. These are continually things. Because here's what I know. You can take the man out of Cariot, but you cannot take the Cariot out of the man. You can take Judas out of his hometown, but you can't take that hometown out of the Judas. It lingers. And so what do we do? Given the nature of this city's history and its people, how it was chosen by God but never quite lived up to what God intended, it makes sense that Judas might squander that opportunity given to him, even if he had said his whole life, I'll never end up like that, which is exactly what I did. I'll never end up like my dad. And I didn't. When I turned 21, I didn't drink. I was like, I know that I will be just like him if I do that. I knew that I would. People are like, well, it was a religious reason, right? No, it was a family reason because I saw what it would have been in my own life. I'll never end up like that. But the thing about darkness in our hearts is that all, it always finds a way to come out. And it came out for me in these ways. The truth is, you can't take the chariot out of a man. But Jesus can, and Jesus tried to with Judas. That's why he chose Judas to be among the twelve, because he believed that Judas might break the cycle. Luke even attests to this, okay? In the way that he introduces the list of disciples, let's read from Matthew real quick. Uh, Jesus called his twelve disciples, gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve. Boom, 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 boom. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, got it? Memorize it. Luke, boom, 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 and finally Judas Iscariot, who, what, became a traitor. Notice the difference. Matthew, Judas Iscariot, the traitor. Luke, Judas Iscariot, who became one. He didn't start out that way. And Luke gets it. Just like all of us, Judas had a heart that straddled the line between faithful and betrayal. And that is the first lesson from Judas in this series. That we all have a sinful nature that's somewhere living inside of our hearts that bends us toward rebellion. And some days we listen to it, and some days we overcome it. But it always seems like it's present, doesn't it? 
Some days we rationalize why we do the things that we do. We have a million reasons for why we should act and feel a certain way or how we have a right to act in a certain way. And shoot knows, I have made those excuses. Well, if you understood my dad, or if you understood my family, or if you understood what I had been through. But the truth is, and I say this to you all the time jokingly, players make plays, not excuses. And Jesus makes a play for every one of us to break the cycle of excuses and blame and shame. Jesus looks at us and says, Judas, I choose you to come to me. I choose you. And just as Jesus chose Judas, Jesus chooses you. He plucks you out of your isolation and tries to put you in a place where you belong. He handpicks you even with your personal baggage and he chooses you knowing, ah, this is so crazy about the love of God. Jesus chooses you knowing you have the potential to betray him and cause him disappointment and heartbreak just as Judas did and Jesus still takes the risk. Because Jesus could make excuses like we do, but Jesus isn't going to make an excuse for not choosing you. Jesus is going to choose you. And the, the question is, do we receive that? And do we in turn say, I'm choosing you. You are the Christ. You're the one that I'm following with my whole life. Or do we say, all of this is enough? Jesus is going to do everything in his power, just like he did with Judas, as we will see over the next few weeks, to keep us from betraying and straying. The cycle of sin in your life and in my life can end today by simply saying yes to Jesus. You're like, wait, I've said yes every single time I come into this place. It's never had an effect, but I'm telling you, Jesus has chosen you. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but what it does mean is that there is victory and there is hope at the end of the day, even though you are whoever you are from not around the kingdom of God, Jesus is calling you into it. So the question tonight is, do you receive that? How do you hear Jesus calling your name, choosing you to be his follower? Do you answer that call, regardless of whatever excuses you have? Let's pray. God, in our lives, we rebel.